Today's episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Benjamin Opdyke. Benjamin Opdyke would like to thank the nuisances that builders and homeowners despise. Our premium products protect from those pesky things like rain, snow, UV rays, and the neighbor's sprinkler system. Take Hydrogap SA, the first self-adhered drainable house wrap that combines a true air barrier and drainage gap. Or Invisirap UV, an all-black WRB, perfect for long-term moisture protection behind open joint siding. Backed by an unmatched 25-year warranty, Benjamin Opdyke's UV-protected rain screen system not only features Invisirap UV, but HydroFlash UV+, a high-performance vapor permeable flashing tape. Visit BenjaminOpdyke.com to learn more about their comprehensive, durable systems. Overhanging second floor. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's an eyesore. There's no getting rid What's of that. What's also a uh, thermal disaster. Right. Those are well, notorious yeah. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. being cold and it's leaky. Right. Right. Yeah. But there's there's such good squirrel houses though. <laughs> for, for squirrels in the winter. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by professional estimator Ian Schwant. How are you doing, Patrick? Our Senior Editor at GBA, Kylie Jacques. Hello, everybody. And our producer and small engine enthusiast, Jeff Rose. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please do that because we love to get your questions and feedback. Well, it is a pleasure to see you all this morning. How is everybody? Very good. Great. Good. Yeah. Uh, Kylie, you wanted to tell us about a project you've been working on with Randy Williams for GBA. And Randy is doing something that we've talked about before on the show. He's building a barn dominium. And you <laughs> have pointed out to the staff at FHB that um, he's doing a much better job air sealing one of these structures than would be typical. How's, how's that going? Well, actually, Ian brought this up, and I thought, oh, this is perfect timing because of um, Aunt, Randy is actually presenting this project at IBS, probably could be as we speak. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, and he's doing a series for GBA that's going to cover specifically the four control layers, because we should talk a little bit, and maybe you have, but for listeners, uh, you know, listening to today's episode. So post and frame construction, which is what this barn dominium structure is, um, is it was traditionally used as an inexpensive um, structure for storage, usually in an agricultural context. But what Randy's finding is that in his market, and he's based in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, Climate Zone 5, um, it's becoming something that people are interested in. They're requesting. He's seeing them pop up more and more in residential market. So um, he's involved in one such project right now. And the thing about these is that um, f getting all of those control layers correct is difficult because of the spans of, say, for instance, the um, one he's working on right now, the posts are, you know, six feet on center, and trying to insulate that comes with some challenges. So I just wrote, good old Randy, I had all these notes that I was going to share about his challenges based on the one introductory post that he has shared with me. I don't have a lot of information yet, and maybe Ian can speak to it, but he did write me right back, and this is what Randy said about how he's handling some of these things. Um, in Minnesota, we are well versed with this type of air control um, because we use so much poly. Not, I'm not a fan of poly on the walls, so we're using the Sega's um, major. I can never remember how to say that out loud. Matrix. I know the product, but I don't remember how to say it. Um, so we should tell folks this is a, uh, a vapor permeable membrane air, uh, barrier, right? And it's, Smart it's like a fabric retarder, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, he's, uh, let's see, the ceiling is a reinforced poly. He's writing this on the go, so forgive me. Um, the outside water control is similar. We're using a mechanically attached WRB, which is taped. Um, very simple, except for the six foot on center posts. Um, so the installation is challenging. Both the water and air controls are protected by the two by horizontal wall girts 
um, kind of like a service cavity. So there's a little hint at some of the interesting things that he's doing. Um, but the, what's interesting to me is that the structure itself, people want it because they want large storage areas for either a workshop, garage, um, extra storage, vehicles. So, it, you know, he talked about how snow covered vehicles will be in that space. And so there's high levels of humidity that need to be handled. Um, all of this attached to a living quarters. So he's, he's shooting for, these things are notoriously leaky, and he's shooting for um, uh, one air exchange per hour in the storage, and he's gonna shoot for less than that in the living quarters. That's but, nuts. Yeah, but, but he's had some feedback from people that say, oh, it's totally doable. You can do I this. don't know if that's true, but boy, is that ambitious. What do yeah. you think about this, Ian? Yeah. I, I love it, and I'm going to rip it off from my shop because uh, <laughs> it it solved all the all the problems that I kept running into with the shop. We should tell would, folks that you have plans to build one of these yourself for your your workshop, right? right? Yeah. So, uh, are you going to have know, living we, quarters there too? No. Well, so I keep joking that I want to have an apartment upstairs so that when my wife gets mad at me, I have somewhere to go. <laughs> um, well, that's the omindium part of it, she, right? <laughs> yeah, she she doesn't think that's necessary that she's going to boot me out of the house anytime soon. But well, it, she's going to take the, the apartment if <laughs> <laughs> problems arise. I suspect. Yeah, no, she likes the kitchen too much. It would be all me. Uh -huh. um, but so we're building. We built our house on my family farm, and and the farm part that is active has run out of space. So we need to build another shed for a lot of the equipment that we have on the farm. And we're going to build it on the north side of our property so it acts as a wind block uh, against our house and helps us be just a little bit more energy efficient. So we're going to build something in the neighborhood of like 70 by 36. And my shop is going to take up the east facing quarter of it. And then we're going to put solar panels on it to power our house. But I was really struggling with how to insulate my shop so that I could still go out there when it's 27 below if I really wanted to and, and try and heat it to 50 degrees and, and keep the, the humidity and moisture down in it. Um, but I struggled with, with how to come up with a way to achieve that that didn't add on a bunch of material. And I, I think what Randy's doing is, is great. Uh, we've talked about it before. The challenge with one of these structures is by the time you put enough uh, wood pieces in there, you are pretty much uh, arrived yep. at the number of sticks you need for stick framing, platform right. framing or whatever, more conventional stud walls. Ian, what kind of insulation is he using? He didn't say. Uh, on uh, his Instagram posts, it looks like he's using uh, rock wool bats that are just pressure fit in in between the, the vertical six foot on center posts. And then the plan is drywall on the interior between the yeah. posts. Is that right? It, he's got the the vapor control membrane on the inside. And then I think he was talking about additional horizontal two by four girts. I'm guessing he'll probably be doing like two feet on center or something like that. And then drywall on the, the inside. I'm interested to see how he goes about putting the windows in. He hasn't posted anything about that yet because I do want to have windows in the shop. So how big of those, how, what size bats does Rockwell come in? Because I'm trying to picture six feet on center posts. Is that what the girts do? It's like, how do you, how big are those bats? Thinking they of the in installation. Stand, yeah, the standard stud cavity bats, so 16 on center and, and two foot on center. But they're, I think they're four feet long and they're very rigid, so. Okay. The, the application he's using them for, I think they're they're perfect for. Right. Okay. My big question is, how the heck is he going to get one air change per hour at fifty with like big doors that are commonplace well, on yeah. this kind of structure? I don't I don't see I, that happening. I've asked him to do an entire post on those over. He's got overhead garage doors, and you know that's a constant source of um, questioning on GBA. How, how to insulate an air seal garage doors. Yeah, I'm, I so, want to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stay, stay tuned. I've noticed uh, lately in going out to restaurants here in Wisconsin that a lot of the ones that were built during the time that Sarah and I lived in New York all have these commercial garage doors on them that open up to the outside. 
So when it's cold out in the winter, I'm like the weirdo walking up to the garage doors <laughs> in the restaurant and like seeing how much air leakage they have. And for the most part, they're all pretty good. So I, they I would really have wonder to be how they do it. Yeah. People wouldn't want to dine there if they weren't. I, yeah. That would be awful, right? To mm. be in a draft Cold, uh, while yeah. you're enjoying your Cabernet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeff, do you have anything to report lately? Uh, no, not a whole lot. It's been very quiet. I got to tell you folks, my weekend project, uh, is a perfect example of how 15 minutes of painting can take hours of preparation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had to set up a scaffold in my new barn staircase to paint the uh, ceiling and the top of the uh, partition wall that we built. And, um, what a hassle, you know, working on staircases is just a real pain. And now I got this 30 inch wide Baker scaffold set up in there and I got to do like contorting to get onto it. I got to squeeze my body through the, the rungs of the, you know, end frame. Uh, it's, it's, I, I probably did this dozens of time and I have at least as many bruises on my legs and back. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, man. It looks just fantastic. When you're all said and done and you don't have to think about it again, you're going to be thrilled. Kylie, I think about you oftentimes when I'm doing <laughs> projects around the house because one because time Because you know you said, how much I would hate it? <laughs> well, no. You said with me one time, I, you said, what do you do for fitness? And I say, I do yeah. carpentry. I work around yeah. the house. And you're like, well, that's not aerobic. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm thinking you haven't done a lot of the stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, have you, you had to set up? When we were when we were talking before, Patrick, it's a wonder anybody survives this type of work. <laughs> right. You asked me ahead of the show, Ian, we'll tell folks, uh, you said, have you ever seen one of these, uh, you know, small scaffolds fall, fall over? And I have not. Uh, and I didn't want to have that happen. So I actually <laughs> yeah. took a structural screw and, and fastened it to my, you know, barn uh, framing so it wouldn't fall That's over with me on it. Yeah. You got to trust that stuff. It has to work. Yeah. You can't right. fall off that and it can't fall down the steps. Yeah, you could kill yourself. Mm -hmm. It would make a mess. <laughs> <laughs> or you could Ruin kill yourself. Ruin the paint job. <laughs> <laughs> Ruin the paint job, exactly. And spill all that paint on the floor <laughs> and on your stairs. Oh, God. That's the other thing I couldn't stop wives. thinking about was spilling paint all down my new steps. I need what, Kylie? This is why men need wives to remind themselves. It's, it's not so much about the paint job as it is about your neck breaking. <laughs> Liam came up with the uh, expression uh, next somersault when we had an ice storm recently. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do one of those next somersaults that I see in YouTube videos. And I'm like, God, I hope not. <laughs> I haven't finished uh, with your uh, uh, will yet, son, so don't, don't wish that upon me. <laughs> Uh, boy, as always, uh, we got some great feedback. Uh, Kylie, uh, your well saga has uh, generated a lot of conversation about I know, it's water like a quality. Mini, it's a mini series at this point. I thought I'd give it a rest today, but this was a good email. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to John's uh, woes with well water. Uh, he says, I just listened to podcast 428. I thought I would share my experience with water quality. I've written in about my old house before, which was built in 1954. When we moved in, we had a well pit, basically a concrete box, which held a standard well casing and a submersible pump with a pressure tank a foot or so away from the well casing and a leaky bit of plywood over the top of it all. There were a few problems. The block wall of the pit had heaved and was cracked. So when we got heavy rains, the well pit would fill with water and flood the well with surface water. Yuck. There was a drain in the pit, but it was paved over at some point, which also had freezing issues. So we kept the halogen work light in the pit, shining at the vulnerable parts, which did a great job until it burned out and we didn't notice. We don't know what happened at that point, but I bet it wasn't good. Um, we also started having problems with pinhole leaks in the copper tubing. Unfortunately, they were all behind tiled walls and under kitchen cabinets. Most of the house had copper tubing replaced with PVC, but not in the hard to reach areas. That led to leaks behind the tile walls and a flooded kitchen where the refrigerator ice maker line corroded and gave up. That's in addition to having replaced fixtures, green stains, the ice maker solenoid repeatedly failing in the refrigerator, and the water solenoids in the washing machine failing. That led to another flood when it wouldn't stop filling. We could only get about five years with water heaters. This was my first time dealing with well water. I grew up in an area where 40 plus year old water heaters are common and copper is king. 
I heard something about acidic well water, so I used the simple test trips for our pool. It's not something everyone had on hand, but we did it in it. It was tested acidic. Next step, I took a sample to the pool store for free analysis. Yep, acidic water. Next, I went to the water treatment store for a free water analysis. In our area, most of the companies give a free basic analysis. They will do more advanced uh, tests for small costs, which I haven't done that yet. In our case, they recommended adding an acid neutralizer and an optional water softener. The analysis of the existing water was not too bad, marginal for softening. In our case, we have a small house which limited our options. We extended the well casing above the ground, filled in the well pit, and moved the pressure tank inside. For the water heater, we went with a Ream Marathon because I didn't want to deal with another rotted out water heater. We should tell folks who don't know, this is a plastic uh, tanked water heater. It's somewhat expensive, but um, it's also more efficient. And some uh, super ambitious energy folks use this for space heating as well. We added an acid neutralizer as well, but didn't have room for a softener. I also wanted a whole house filter for sediment, uh, and my reading led me to believe that the acid neutralizer would essentially do the same thing. However, talking to the water reps and installers, we got conflicting information. For the product we went with, I was told would not do that, so we went with it anyway, thinking it would add a cartridge filter later if needed. Surprise, no more sediment. It worked like we had hoped, even though we were told it probably wouldn't. The only downside so far is the water. After being treated by the acid neutralizer, it leaves chalky deposits, but it's not a major issue. It's actually a great trade-off from the green stains from before. The Marathon water heater has worked flawlessly for two years, but it's really not long enough to compare it to my old units. It's also a lot bigger than usual water heaters of the same gallons. However, that's part of the, and that's part of the reason we couldn't fit in our water softener. But it looks really cool. <laughs> In any case, I don't, I don't know if this is interesting to you, but I love your podcasts, which are definitely interesting to me. Thank you. Thank you, John. I find it very interesting. Yeah, me too. Um, my takeaway from this is my, my, my water heater is not bound to last more than five years. My, <laughs> my brand new water heater. Yeah. Yeah, this is good information for sure. I've heard of folks with pinhole leaks in the copper, and boy, nothing would keep me up at night like that. I tell you, mm -hmm. not knowing when or where one of those leaks is going to pop up. Oh, my gosh. You couldn't go anywhere with any comfort. I wouldn't be able to <laughs> go out to dinner at night. You'd be just staring at the walls where you knew that you had plumbing just waiting for them to leak. Ah, uh, home ownership. <laughs> I'd have my stethoscope on the, on the behind wall cavity, yep. so I'd be listening for the... <laughs> You'd have to get the moisture meter out and be constantly testing your drywall mm. for, uh, for its water so moisture. The places level. where um, uh, PVC and CPVC have a uh, greatest market acceptance seem to have this problem. And uh, it's a great solution in those areas. It's inexpensive. PAX probably works too. But I don't, I don't know what you did before that because my guess is like galvanized pipes would have had similar problems uh, That's before what I we have. had plastics. Yeah. You have galvanized pipe, Kylie? Yep. Boy, have you confirmed that your low water volume issues are not related to that? Because those things can get occluded and really cut back on your volume. I'm sure it's adding to it. But when you picture the uh, point filled with holes on the sand point well, it's easy to imagine that's also all gunked up. So it's probably a combination. Well, I mean, it would depend on what the material was of the well point. I mean, if it was brass or stainless, I bet it would be a lot more resistant to corrosion than uh, galvanized steel because it's only mm. galvanized on the outside. It's not galvanized on the inside, mm. I think. Yeah. Either way, you got to rip it all apart. Oh, yeah. It's super awesome. <laughs> um, this comes from David from Sweden. Uh, hello, anti-radiant floor heat podcast. <laughs> 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 he noted that you came up with this, Ian. Um, <laughs> I'm an American who grew up in Florida and now lives and works in Sweden. As you may have guessed, the thermal priorities of home construction in these two places couldn't be more different. Uh, here in Sweden, hydronic floor heat is, I dare say, the standard in new home construction. Common practice is slab on grade, which means eight inches of stone, 12 inches of EPS, four inches of concrete with PEX for heating, uh, in two-story houses, the second floor often gets wall mount radiators. My question is, primarily for you, Patrick, as you seem to be the most anti, what is it that is so inefficient about floor heat? <laughs> 
if you're comparing it to other hydronic heating systems, it, it doesn't seem like it would be much different. Does it have to do with how the water is heated or how much energy the circulation pump uses? On the whole, Sweden is further ahead on climate concerns than the US, so I would assume floor heat must be more efficient than other hydronic methods. Could it be a comfort issue with season changes? I will say it's more common here to throw on a sweater or take one off if you're unhappy with the temperature than it is to adjust a thermostat. Perhaps it's simply that. Personally, I think floor heat gives a more even comfortable experience than trying to sit closer or further from the radiator that is normally placed under a window. That experience is likened to what we call a hot fudge sundae as teenagers. <laughs> we would drive around with the windows down and the heat full blast in the dead of winter. Remember, I'm from Florida. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for your thoughts, David. Well, David, All right, Patrick, I, give it, give it to us. Give us your definitive anti-radiant floor heat rant. So, in a nutshell, my beef with radiant floor heat is uh, largely none of the above. My mm -hmm. problem with radiant floor heat is you don't need it if you are in a well-insulated, well-air sealed homes. There are much less. Uh, expensive heating systems that also offer cooling and uh, work nearly as well to keep you comfortable. I admit, uh, radiant floor heat is a very lovely, comfortable experience in the places I've, ex I've uh, stayed where this is a thing. And um, the other issue is, I'm guessing the folks in Sweden don't go and turn the thermostat when they're warmer, a little too warm or too cold, because it's not going to respond that quickly anyway. Right. right. Um, it's, it takes hours uh, for those things to uh, change, or at least a half an hour. And uh, so, There's also I don't know, I think it's, it's just a matter of where you live. We, in most of the U.S., need uh, heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. And if you have an in-floor hydronic system, um, it, you're going to need a separate cooling system. So why not just make that do your heating too? in a nutshell, is how I feel about it. That's what I was reading about too, Patrick, and I came across another point with the in-floor hydronic tubing installed in a slab on grade. The house may have more heat loss to the ground than a house with forced air heating system. And that, that makes perfect sense to me. Well, um, except, if, I mean, David's if, saying that they have 12 inches of EPS. I was going to yeah. say, if there's not, I guess the whole thing is how the, de how the slab is insulated or how well it's insulated. That's a big piece of it, right? But for several hours a day, the temperature of the concrete will be above the room temperature, so that potentially increases the rate of heat loss from slab to soil. You know, I always try and uh, think about resilience when I'm mm -hmm. talking about heating systems for a house in a heating climate or, you know, a severe cooling climate too. Like, um, you should make the house so it can handle a period of power interruption mm. and, and not make you die of heat or cold. Um, so I would say spend your money on insulation and air sealing and efforts that uh, will keep your house comfortable when you don't have any power. And, and you know, if you're running in Florian heat, you absolutely need a circulator pump to make it work in the winter time. And, you know, if you have a, a generator, you can keep that going. But if you have a really well sealed house, you don't need to worry about that for, you know, a day or two. I will say that Alex Wilson, who's the founder of Building Green and played a large hand in GBA's launch too, um, has an article that is really rich and it's it's titled uh, Radiant Floor Heating When It Does and Doesn't Make Sense. And he, in from let's see, uh, from the, it's an analysis of the in-floor hydronic system from a green perspective. So like you were saying earlier, high performance homes, they don't make much sense, but he does list a number of building types where they do make good sense. Um, and I can either share that or just throw people to the, to the link to read about it. No, I'd love to hear what, what okay. he says about that. Um, where they do make sense. In houses and small commercial buildings with conventional levels of insulation and standard insulated glass windows. Um, in buildings with large open spaces and tall ceilings. In buildings where air flushing is common, such, such as garages, fire stations, airplane hangars, industrial spaces. And when cost is not an issue. That was Ian's uh, <laughs> deciding factor, I'm sure. <laughs> well, one of our deciding factors was that both my wife and I don't like uh, four stairs. So we're, yeah, in, there's Matt, that. Yeah. we're in the Matt Milham camp on I that. Hate, my, I hate it too. I hear you. My wife does have asthma issues from her childhood. So, you know, not having the four stair uh, 
providing Actually, heat and cooling is is a good thing um, for her. But we also do have the the tall ceilinged and large living room space on the first floor. But uh, I think there's also, as I've talked about on the podcast before, the tendency is to put in way too much tubing in a high performance home. So like we we did the calculations per you know, BTU per foot of uh, packs to come up with what we needed. And so far we've been been pretty happy with it, but I will admit it doesn't run very often in our uh, basement where our bedrooms are, it doesn't need to. What's the spacing of the tubing? Uh, typically it's, it's like seven or eight inches on center, but ours is actually uh, on the main floor, it's 16 on center. And then I want to say it's 16 or 18 on center in the basement slab. Uh, this this subject has generated a lot of interest among listeners. Uh, this comes from Roberta. What about electric radiant? I live in North <laughs> Texas, which does get cold, but not by your standards. I plan to remodel my bath, removing the tub, enlarging the shower, etc. The, that bathroom is the coldest in the house, and I want a warm bathroom when I get up. I think radiant heat in that one room is the answer. That way I don't have to have the whole house warmer in an effort to warm one room. The people I've talked with act like they know what radiant heat is, but I've wondered if they've actually installed it. Thanks, Roberta. <laughs> I think that's great, Roberta. You have this, right, Ian? You love it. Uh, we actually don't have the electric radiant heat. We just have the the hydraulic tubing in tubes. the bath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey. One What's of up, the Patty? things that I thought was uh, to what level is she going to remodel this bathroom? Is there any, you know, insulating and air sealing updates that could be made to it, especially if it's a, a cold corner of the house, it might not have been done up to current standards in, in North Texas when the house was built. Yeah. One thing that's commonly wrong is there's no insulation behind. If you have a molded tub of plastic or fiberglass, uh, you know, it depends on what, uh, how expensive a Roberta's house is. But those are often uh, poorly air sealed or even uninsulated behind there. And that is a great uh, thing to investigate with your uh, thermal camera because mm. uh, if you have enough Delta T, that'll show up as a big color change. Mm. I want to add a little aside here, this complete side note, but I thought it was of interest given the topic is so, uh, you know, people are into it. Um, so there's another type of heated floor. It's called a hypocost. Do you guys know what this is? No. <laughs> Koreans do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they are thick masonry floors with embedded hot air ducts or flues, and they were once common in Korea and were also used in a few solar homes in the 1970s and 80s, but are rarely installed now. So instead of hot water pumping through the floor, you've got hot air pumping through the floor. Yeah, and it's uh, sounds like a nightmare. Big, thick assembly, <laughs> right? That's the ones I I've bet. seen are like 14 inches thick. With, <laughs> it looks crazy. It's what the Romans used to do. Is that yes, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Roberta, don't listen to me. Put your electric radiant floor <laughs> heat in there. It's fine. People do love it. The one thing is you got to make sure that it get, to get it right. And I'm working up with uh, Doug Horgan. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he's done horror stories on, with spray foam, and we're going to do horror stories with electric radiant in floor heat too. So um, look how to get that wrong. He d he got <laughs> He's gotten it wrong so you don't have to and had to fix it. Um, as you can imagine, folks who pay tons of money to have their bathrooms remodel and the uh, tile installer didn't put enough radiant in front of the mirror, for example, mm. uh, boy, that's a disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> right. right where you want it. Uh, this comes from Vic. Hello, podcasters. Thanks for all the great information. Regarding podcast 428, discussing humps in the floor. Ian mentioned issues with humps and raised ranches in the Northeast. My first house was a raised ranch in Connecticut built in 1979. The main floor, upper level, did indeed have a hump in the floor running down the middle of the house. Why? Because the center of the house was supported by a steel beam with the subfloor resting on top, while the remainder of the house was framed conventionally with uh, sawn lumber. As the joist lumber shrank, the steel beam didn't uh, and, resulted in a hump, and resulted in a hump. It is, of course, preferable to have your joist on top of the steel beam, which eliminates this issue, but that would significantly reduce the ceiling height under the beam in the lower level of the house, which is living space in the case of a raised ranch, right? But this isn't what we were talking about, though, because the, as I recall, right. it was like it, uh, it, uh, where the elevated porch met the house, right? The exterior wall. 
Right. And I think I mentioned it where there's, you know, overhangs on the raised branch that cantilever out a couple of feet to add living space to that main floor. But I've seen that too, where the subfloor is right over the, the top of the beam and similar raised branches. You know, boy, I, I going to admit, I wouldn't have thought about that uh, as a potential issue. And boy, I bet that would create a half inch or a three eighths inch hump uh, typically, right? Because your two by 12s are going to sh- shrink that much. Yeah. You think it'd be visually noticeable or you just feel it when you're walking the floor? Oh, I think it would show through everything. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. Typically the raised ranches have uh, a wall Shag going carpeting, down. which obscures this. The remodeled ones uh, probably don't have shag, but uh, they usually have a wall going down the, the middle, but sometimes when you remodel, you take part of that wall out and you open the, the dining room to the living room. And that's where it really shows when mm. you try to connect those two areas. God, how do you fix yeah, that? Ian? Do Are you, you out there that? grinding down the flange on the I-beam? <laughs> I've only ever worked in raised ranches with a, a house flipper. So you can imagine oh. we did not fix <laughs> it. did it. not fix it. <laughs> <laughs> it was not huh. in the budget to make that look right. Does that become a structural concern? Probably not. No. I think what we typically did was we left it as two different types of flooring. Mm. So you you had the dining room area open to the living room, but left tile in the dining room and then picked it up in the middle as wood floor going into the living room. I would love to hear what other listeners have done in this situation because there is tons of these houses out there. Yeah. And uh, when steel beams started to become popular in the 60s for this kind of uh, framing application, I wonder if those framers knew or thought about that Mm. guess not i always thought that uh like a small architecture firm could really do good work in the northeast by figuring out a way to make raised ranches look cool yeah right because there's so many cul-de-sacs just loaded with them so many of them in the northeast and they all kind of start to look the same they all look the same period (laughs) on my uh drive to my son's school a couple times a week. Uh, we go through neighborhoods where there are, you know, hundreds of these homes. Mm-hmm. And uh, the more I look at them, the more I think you just got to embrace what it is yeah. and uh, and learn to love it if you don't. And yeah. uh, learn to love the uh, space efficiency that these homes offer. They're not all bad. There's some good things to be said about them mm-hmm. design-wise. The thing about yeah. them that drives me bonkers is the cantilever, cantilever I never say that word right, but you know what I'm talking about. The, the, the overhanging second floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's an eyesore. There's no getting rid well, of that. What's also a uh, thermal disaster. Right, Those they, are well, notorious yeah. for yeah, 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 yeah. being cold they're and leaky. Right. Right. Yeah. But there's there's such good squirrel houses, though. <laughs> for, for squirrels I mean, in the winter. Am I right to think that the whole reason behind those is to add square footage to the, to the main At living the area? At the absolute lowest cost, yeah. right? Because yeah. you're not making the foundation any bigger, but you're right. getting a pretty significant bump on the, sec- or on the main level. Yeah, right. Hm. And an aesthetic uh, interest. <laughs> architectural interest. Yeah, architectural interest. <laughs> We, oh, boy, we've got to get to some questions here. Folks yeah, right, are probably right. getting antsy who listen to this crazy show. Uh, this is from Wade. Hello, FHB crew. I have two questions about a rental property I recently purchased, which was built in 1968. It is an upper and lower duplex, but I am only flipping the lower unit for now. All the exterior and interior walls are concrete block. The first question is, how do I insulate and finish the interior walls? I've torn off all the existing lath and plaster, which cover the exterior walls in the kitchen and bathroom. The interior walls are just covered with cement. My thoughts are to apply a liquid membrane as a water prevention method, then cover the exterior walls with EPS or XPS foam with one by four secured through the foam into the block with tap cons, and finally one half inch of moisture resistant drywall. The second question is, is how to finish the floor. As per the photo of the kitchen, you can see what's left of the hodgepodge of build-up flooring that covered the concrete throughout the entire house. My ideal plan is to rip all that out and lay LVP on top of the existing concrete, thereby gaining an extra three and a half inches or so in headroom. I imagine I will have to have some kind of barrier between the LVP and concrete, but what do I go with? Can I get away with just a thin layer of underlayment or something, or should I use something more robust like dimple mat and sub, some type of subfloor over that? I'm open to any and all suggestions. Please keep in mind it is a rental, so I would prefer not to break the bank. 
Thanks in advance for your help. Keep up the great work. Wade from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Climate Zone 6. So the first thing that was interesting to me about Wade's uh, house and photographs is the block construction, which I've seen in Florida and a few places uh, scattered about, but I wouldn't have guessed in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where it is so freaking cold. But then I got to thinking about it, and my guess is there's not a lot of trees in Sioux Falls, but, you know, uh, this house is also not that old. So I don't know what's going on, but what do you guys think? Ian? <laughs> I, I think they probably have more masons than carpenters in that okay. area. Oh, yeah. That's a uh, there's pockets sense. of of Wisconsin that have just tons of CMU construction. And one of the first jobs that I had in, in construction was laboring for block masons. And you know, that's why you the, became a carpenter, I'm sure. Exactly. I lasted <laughs> about a year and a half and was like, man, forget that. What, what is lighter? <laughs> so I got to find you, something better to do. <laughs> how do you, I, I looked for this on GBA, but I didn't come up with, I mean, mo, it was the information I found was related to new construction and they were just, you know, advocating for insulated concrete blocks, but this is an existing house. So how do you insulate and finish a basement with concrete block? Well, this is the whole house, uh, but what most building scientists say is you really want to insulate on the outside, outside and masonry, right. in a, and especially in a cold climate, and especially a really cold climate like this. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the best thing, because if you um, insulate on the inside, the heat transfer from the interior, which would keep the block and masonry from spalling, that he's no longer getting to the outside to warm those blocks. So now you have a freeze-thaw situation, and uh, I'm sure that's pretty dramatic in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I imagine it must be such an enormous project, though, to excavate the entire foundation to, to then add exterior insulation, right? Oh, it is, and then he's going to have to reside. He's going to have to deal with his window uh, penetrations and door penetrations and any other penetrations and detail those so water doesn't get behind the insulation. It's, it's a huge project. I don't know what to say, except I might be tempted to leave it alone. Mm. You know, replaster the way it was and put it back together the way it was built. Hmm. I know Jeff, there are you... insulation products that you can pour into the, the concrete blocks uh, hmm. to at least give them some amount of insulation. Uh, the other thing you could do, I, I was wondering at first if you could do the, you know, what Martin Holiday has in a couple of his GBA and fine home building posts with retrofitting basement insulation where you would use the foam board on the inside and then you know, do a, a typical stud wall. But I think Patrick, you make a good point about the CMUs being a different animal than a poured concrete wall. It's, uh, it's risky, you know, and it's the colder it is, the riskier it is. You know, some of these work okay, but it's not a given. I wonder if he could, the idea of filling the concrete cores with some insulation puts me in mind of a product that Ben Bogey is using right now called the Perfect Block. And it it is ICF blocks filled with um, a co composite material that is sh ground EXP, or excuse me, um, EPS foam with a cement binder. It's interesting. He loves it. So they're like solid, basically, yeah, but they're the, the in yeah. interior material is probably lower density than the, right. than the rest of it. Mm. That's right. What could he use in this case? That would be impossible. That seems impossible. Wade. And it's a rental property. So right, right, gotta, right, right, right. Yeah, there's there's that. the perfect Patrick question. You got to think as cheap and easy as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you got his number. <laughs> I think uh, that's totally true. That's what I would say. This is yeah. uh, not the place to experiment. It's not the place to spend a ton of money. Uh, put the thing back the way it was. Make it nice. And, uh, you know, there's a huge need for rental, uh, yeah. affordable rental housing. And, uh, boy, if you can solve the air leakage, uh, you know, it won't be terrible to heat this place, I'm guessing. Yeah. I wouldn't want to live in it. <laughs> what do you think of his question about the floor? I think that, uh, you know, insulating a floor, it gets you less than insulating walls. So if you're not going to insulate the walls, skip the floor too and put some kind of res uh, robust uh, flooring on top of the concrete. Uh, luxury vinyl plank, LVP, is a perfect solution, I would say. Yeah. Those, those things seem pretty tough. And 
at TDS, we typically don't put anything under it. Our flooring contractor just puts it right over concrete, but the, the concrete does need to be flat uh, or it, it doesn't necessarily have to be level, but it has to be in plane. You can't have a lot of undulations to it. So I would suggest for that that he uses some like Ardex product uh, for it. We should tell um, folks, Ian, that is a uh, leveling compound. You mix it yep. with water. It kind of looks like joint compound, yep. powdered joint compound, and uh, you use this to level uh, flooring. Yeah, there is also something much more akin to joint compound called Dash Patch, which is gypsum-based. And I did look up on their website their standard type of Dash Patch. They don't recommend you doing under a floating floor because the lifting of the floor just that little bit can pop it uh, and, and damage it so they do make a like a, a higher density product for that but we typically use ardex uh, or something uh, cement based do those products add some comfort to the floor like when i picture those types of if that vinyl LVP on top of directly on top of cement. There's a part of me that thinks, how comfortable is that to walk around on? I, I bet think our you'd listener want... from Sweden would think the same thing. David would be, uh, you know, <laughs> he, he's, I don't mean temperature wise. I mean like give in the floor. Oh, I it's see. It's like what you mean. standing on asphalt. It sounds like to me. I think a, a lot of those products have like a cushioned back Cushion. to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but not all of them do. So I don't know if. Uh, the type that you would put in a rental property would mm -hmm. probably just be flat vinyl planks as opposed to the higher end ones that have that uh, foam or cushioned back to them. Mm -hmm. um, Wade, I hope you'll keep us posted on what you do with your uh, rental unit. And uh, it's, it's a difficult question what to do with masonry uh, structural masonry in cold places, how to insulate it. It's just, it's a hard thing. This comes from Jim in Saratoga Springs, New York. Hi all, I've been a subscriber to FHB Magazine, uh, the website and a podcast lurker for 15 years. Love all of these. Thank you for publishing slash producing them. I have a question from an article in the December 2021 slash January 20. 22 magazine entitled Rain Screen Systems for Stucco by Brian Pontalillo. The article outlined a great approach to ensure an adequate WRB and drainage gap when installing stucco over wood sheathing. However, it ignored a more common wall assembly approach used in the southern stage, which is applying stucco as a finish coat directly over cement block walls. There's no wood sheathing in these walls. How would the principle suggested in this article be adapted to block walls that are going to be top coated or finish and finished with stucco? Or is doing this irrelevant because there's no sheathing to rot? The plan does, does, in, the plan does include wood two by fours on the inside wall structure that houses the insulation and studs for the drywall that could mold or rot if the water slash vapor is able to migrate through the stucco and block. Thanks, Jim Saratoga Springs, New York. It's the concrete block wall show. No yep. kidding, right? I think the block doesn't care, uh, right? It doesn't care if it gets wet, unlike wood sheathing that's going to rot. Yeah, I think it's a totally different application than that article. Uh, the only place where I think the article may have some insight is into wall penetrations for windows and doors. What about capillary action? Isn't that moisture going to be moving... From more to less. From more to less, okay. So if you're, if you're air conditioning, right. you're going to have less. So it is going to want to go inside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it yep. seems like that's a risk. But in southern states, southern uh, states. it's not going to freeze, right? It's not, right. You're not going to have blo uh, water in the block and, and freeze and, and make it uh, spall, explode. Like you would in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Like you would in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, totally. Yeah, I wonder... I, I, the Cooling loads in masonry houses must be less than, wouldn't you think? They must keep houses cooler. Why do you say that? Because they're cooler. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how to articulate it. It just strikes me that I think you're reaching for the thermal mass argument. Maybe. Maybe that is it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we would have to do a different mass walls podcast that we could all brush <laughs> up on the science of mass walls. All right. I think I, I smell a woofy calculation here, right? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Does anyone know what that stands for so we can tell listeners? <sighs> Uh, yeah, I don't think I didn't know what that stands for. So anyway, this is a complex data set uh, that you use to analyze the uh, hy hygro and hydroscopic uh, uh, profile of uh, a wall assembly. I'm sure I got that completely wrong. <laughs> uh, David from Sweden asked, yes, that same guy. Uh, hey, guys and gal, I was commenting on an Instagram post about rock wool, and it occurred to me that mineral insulation bats are commonly without the paper facing that fiberglass bats often have. It is my understanding that the paper facing, when installed correctly, is a key component for managing air and moisture. I've yet to see a post about rock wool that discusses what is used to replace this layer in the wall's construction. All of my experience with rock wool slash stone wool slash mineral insulation has been in Sweden, where a taped age-resistant polyethylene sheet on the warm side is commonly used, so I hadn't reflected on this missing layer before me. I've seen via social media various variable membranes or other vapor barriers being used in North America in conjunction with blown-in plant-based fiber insulation, but I'm concerned that something has gotten lost in translation when transitioning from fiberglass bats to mineral wool bats. Am I on to something or off my rocker? Thanks for all the podcast episodes. The original Fine Home Building podcast is still my all-time favorite. One of these days, I'll watch an episode and figure out what everyone looks like. Keep up the good work. It's appreciated. I wouldn't do that. It'll yeah. just disappoint you, David. <laughs> it's better to just hear the voice. So I did a, I did a, a search after reading his question, and my search term was, uh, why don't mineral wool bats have paper fa facing? And GBA was the top hit, and mineral wool insulation isn't like fiberglass is the answer. And essentially, um, this is what I found out anyway, um, mineral wool is completely different from fiberglass bats, and they both just happen to fall into the broad classification of bats. There is no paper facing because mineral wool does not come with a vapor barrier, and that's because it's an insulation product, not a vapor control product. And that um, insulating uh, is for is not for air sealing. They're two different functions. Somewhere along the way, somebody got the idea to combine a vapor retarder with a fiberglass insulation bat, um, and it turns two construction steps into one, saving money and labor. Um, the problem is that once you cut the vapor retarder, the, fa foil, the facing, um, around electrical boxes, you end up with not a great seal. So mineral wool only comes in unfaced bats. No foil or craft paper vapor retarders are offered. This means an independent vapor retarder must be installed with mineral wool bats. That's what I found out. Boom. Boom. Mic drop. You just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I found the exact same article by Googling the exact same yeah. thing. <laughs> GBA has the answer. Yep. So they craft had it paper. Since April 8th of 2014, according yeah, to Yeah, it's the older, article. right. The craft paper facing on fiberglass bats is a very uh, good uh, variable permanence vapor retarder. And it's it works pretty well, according to research, in, uh, you know, the mixed climates in North America and I'm sure everywhere else in the world too. But when you get into really cold places, you need a dedicated uh, high, oh my God, what is, what is the uh, low permeance uh, vapor retarder? Uh, polyethylene is very common in the far northern US and into Canada. Uh, apparently Sweden also is uh, using uh, polyethylene as a you know, vapor control layer. The short answer is you don't need to worry about that much of North America, right? Your, your drywall is a sufficient vapor control layer, assuming it has uh, paint on it, right? Uh, two coats of paint uh, is a pretty effective and um, for, forgiving uh, vapor retarder. It, it allows drying when it needs to dry, when it, you know, and it prevents vapor migration uh, when, it, when it needs to. So We I think did that's a flash and bat for our... Uh, unvented roof assembly at our house and I think we have four inches of closed cell spray foam and then I want to say I used our 39 bats uh, that took up the rest of the space but it, it was more work to go and tape around all of the uh, boxes for our lights and just stuff like that I couldn't believe how long that that took me to do I uh, 
I think it just has to do, David, let's, let's just say it has to do with the different climate zones in the U.S. and the necessity for a uh, special vapor control layer. You know, you may need it, you may not. Uh, craft bats work pretty good in the climate zone four, uh, five. Uh, research has shown that if you don't use them and you have a thin layer of latex paint, you can get um, vapor migration during the heating climate. And, uh, you know, that could potentially be a problem, especially I'm told with OSB sheathing, which seems to have a greater sensitivity to moisture cycling than plywood does, which um, I don't know why that is, but folks who study this have theorized to me that it's because plywood has uh, gl continuous glue layers between the layers, and that acts as a vapor retarder itself and presents moisture migration from getting all the way into the material, whereas OSB doesn't have that kind of uh, layering uh, that is characteristic of plywood, so. What is the binder for, what is the glue or binder for OSB? Do you know? I don't, um, but I know it was in short supply when Texas <laughs> lost power, uh, right. right? It's where all the, Adhesives manufacturing is is based. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Hmm. One point that Kylie made uh, about the craft faced fiberglass bats that I I don't think should be lost is that they're trying to combine two steps into one product, and that, which is I think helpful, that happens right? Often in yeah. construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, do you want to pay someone to go install bats and then go put up a layer of poly, or are you going to like have the vapor control layer put up at the same time? I think I would want the latter if it worked. Yeah, the fewer times you have to round the house, the better, right? Yeah. And detailing poly to make it an effective uh, vapor retarder is not difficult. You made the point of holes, Kylie, mm -hmm. and the bigger trouble there is air leaks, right? So right. when you have electrical... True. boxes and, and can lights and stuff. The air leaks are the vapor mechanism. Yeah. But if you cut, you know, poly, it's still covering 90 plus percent of the uh, surface area. So it still works relatively well as a vapor control layer. But air control is it, it you have to do different things if you're using it for air control versus vapor control. What good questions today. I, yeah. I'm delighted that we have international listeners. <laughs> I know we now have a Sweden representative. Do you have a little map with pins in it of all the places? Oh, that would be that hey, that's, a that's a great that's idea. That is a great idea. idea. Maybe it will I'll encourage more that. people to write in from other countries. Yeah. So, y'all, I'm going to ask for your help in encouraging David to be on Pro Talk. I, I asked him to be on the show. He's a little on the fence about it. I think he's nervous, but... I think remind, if we hear us, from an, remind us who David is. David is our uh, builder from Sweden. They Sweden, just asked okay, okay. Uh, this question. And um, I think if we hear from enough li listeners, uh, encouraging uh, David that he'll be on Pro Talk and we can ask him all about construction in Sweden. That would be fun. <laughs> he signed his email, Sticks and Steel. I, saw, is, I looked, him, I looked it great. up. Yeah, he's got a company, Sticks and Steel, I think, or an Instagram account at the very least. I want to ask him how he ended up in Sweden via Florida. Uh, that's <laughs> right. got to be a story involved there, right? <laughs> okay, this comes from Brian. Hey, all, huge podcast fan. I have a conundrum I'm hoping someone might be able to shed light on. Long story short, I recently found out our house, which is a 1956 Cape in southern Maine, has an interior clay tile drain but I'm unable to locate an outlet for it outside and our basement does not have a sump pit slash pump. I'm hoping to install a sump pump and was going to do it where the drain emptied. But after some investigation, I looked for a drain outside, I cut small sections open and ran a scope. I'm not able to find any line to the outside in an obvious location. I'm starting to wonder if the line has an outlet at all. This is all prelude to what I'm worried about most. There is one spot in the drain I couldn't get to because the scope line was too short, but this is in the middle of the house and there has no downslope to the drain. So I originally didn't worry about it. I'm concerned I'm having, the concern I'm having after looking into old school drainage is this spot I couldn't get to is where my main sewer line is. And I'm a bit terrified this drain might empty into the main sewer line. Uh, my questions are, do interior drains ever just not have outlet lines? 
Two, was it ever common to empty an interior drain into a municipal sewer line? Three, if the drain is just a sealed system, can I use it to feed into a sump pit or is it unlikely to be sloped correctly to work? Wow, this is a great number of questions and I think it has huge applications for so much of the country. Um, anyone wanna take a stab at this? So I've demoed concrete floors before that had drains in the center of them and Oftentimes they just go to the gravel below, mm -hmm. uh, at least the ones that I've had experience with. And um, also I think back in the day, they were often connected to the sewer line. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of the houses I worked on in Pittsburgh were called combination sewers, which meant that, you know, uh, rainwater, stormwater, and sewage uh, are combined into the same pipe and they all go to the waste treatment facility. And that's why when we have thunderstorms in, I think it's 800 um, cities in the U.S. have outflows that are a combination of storm water and raw sewage that dump into the uh, adjacent uh, nearest body of water, whether it's a river, a big lake, the ocean. And this happens all over the country in, in older cities. So depressing. Um, you know, I know what we're equipped to answer on this show by this point. So I, I phoned a friend, <laughs> <laughs> um, our friend Guy, uh, who I recently recorded a Pro Talk podcast. His his uh, area of expertise is water intrusion issues, and uh, I asked him for his thoughts both in the Pro Talk, which I think. Um, by the time this is this show is aired, we'll already be up on the podcast. So if you folks have interest in this subject, you'll definitely want to listen to someone who knows more than us, and that is a good way to uh, to accomplish that. So uh, a guy says, uh, hi, Patrick, to answer Brian's original question, yes, stormwater from gutters, groundwater from French drains and sewage all went into the same pipe, which is called a combined sewer. This was common from the 1800s until the 1960s in older parts of the country. The combined sewer discharged all of the flow into River Lake without any treatment. In the 1960s, this stopped and the U.S. invested billions in building wastewater treatment systems and works. Sewers were no longer allowed to be combined. Storm water went to the river and sewage went to the treatment works. The story of wastewater treatment is fascinating and a tremendous success story for the U.S. and human slash environmental health that most folks don't know anything about. Back to the question. It is normal to have some sand in the foot. Oh my goodness, so I didn't tell you all this part. So I've been corresponding with Brian uh, ongoing for this whole thing. And uh, this past weekend, he rented a sewer cam from, I'm guessing, the home center and stuck it down there. After some difficulty and talking to the neighbor, he figured out that, yes, all these pipes combine and go to the main sewer line, which is probably out in the street. While he was investigating his drain tile in the, under the basement slab, he found some sand in there and was worried that this would obstruct uh, the drainage capacity of his uh, footing drains, right? So Guy uh, responds to that. Back to the question, it is normal to have some sand in the footing drain, depending on the soil or backfill, especially from a 1950s vintage system. The drain system was meant to be very porous and sand-sized particles can easily enter. Uh, I would not worry about it too much. The groundwater or surface water should never be discharged to the sanitary sewer because the flow will quickly overwhelm the small sanitary sewer line and may cause issues for other neighbors and the wastewater treatment system. But this is a problem nationwide. I would have a professional access the sewer line and camera from the basement to the main, document the video for his records. As long as the sewer is in good condition, I wouldn't make any changes. I would make sure all his gutters are clear and discharge downspouts downslope at least 10 feet away from the house. I would consider myself lucky that the footing drain still works after 70 years. Hmm. I couldn't awesome. agree more. Like, don't go looking for trouble, right? Just <laughs> leave this alone, Brian. <laughs> right? Don't touch it. Be happy it works. Yeah. Kylie, you wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole. I know you no. would be like, no way. <laughs> no, I, yeah. I, yeah. My solution is not like most <laughs> that listen to the show. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. What a fascinating, that, that's some rich information he just shared. The history of, uh, 
water waste man wastewater management in this country would be fascinating to read about. I went, uh, I agree, uh, enough so, Kylie, that I went to the EPA website and yeah. looked up uh, what are combined sewer overflows, mm -hmm. uh, CSOs for those of you who want to follow along. Uh, <laughs> CSOs are sewers that are designed to collect rainwater runoff, domestic sewage, and industrial wastewater in the same pipe. Most of the time, combined sewer systems trans all their wastewater to sewage treatment plant where it is treated and then discharged to a water body. During periods of heavy rain or snow melt, the wastewater volume in a combined sewer system can exceed the capacity of the sewage system or treatment plant. For this reason, combined sewer systems are designed to overflow occasionally and discharge excess directly into nearby streams, rivers, or other water bodies. These overflows, called combined sewer overflows, contain not only stormwater, but also untreated human and industrial waste, toxic materials, and debris. They're a major water pollution concern for approximately 772 cities in the U.S. that have combined sewer systems. CSOs may be thought of as a type of urban wet weather discharge. That means like that, like sanitary sewer overflows and stormwater discharges, they are discharges from municipalities' wastewater conveyance infrastructure that are caused by precipitation events such as rainfall or heavy snow melt. Well, no easy solution to this, right? Because... Can you imagine what it's going to cost to retrofit 772 U.S. cities with entirely new sewer and wastewater treatment facilities? Yeah, it's not going to happen. It's not going I'd to like happen. to know how many of those are on the Great Lakes, because mm. I know it's, it's a big problem on Lake Michigan where Milwaukee is. I know it's a problem in Lake Erie. So I got to think there's a lot of them on the Great Lakes. Yeah. Right, it's a problem in Pittsburgh where the Allegheny County Sanitary Authority, Authority dumps, you know, millions of gallons of sewage annually into the three rivers that are in Pittsburgh. All right. We need to end on an up note. Patrick, what do you got? Because <laughs> that's, that's just depressing stuff. Oh, I got a good one. So um, people surf on Lake Erie, right, in the wintertime. Um, but you're not supposed to surf. Uh, surf near certain places in Cleveland because of the sewage discharge uh, <laughs> that might occur at any time. It's a big pipe, Yuck. right? It's like four or five foot in Jeez. diameter, and it can just start spewing sewage where you want to be surfing. <laughs> you started <laughs> off good there, Patrick. I know. I got all excited about a lakeside vacation or something. <laughs> uh, wow. You know, I want to uh, thank Benjamin Obdyke for sponsoring uh, February's Fine Home Building Podcast. You guys make good stuff, and I sure appreciate the support of the program. It's, it's very kind, and uh, they're nice people there. Anything, guys, you want to say? No, I don't think so. I'm right. surprised you're not at uh, IBS in Florida this week. So the company decided with the uh, when Omicron started getting weird that, you know, we would limit how many folks were going. Um, I have mixed feelings about it. I love the show very much. Uh, at the time, I was more scared about the virus than I am now. Yeah, it has changed a little bit since that decision is, was made. At the time, it made perfect sense. Uh, you know, you folks all know this stuff, but New Jersey, Connecticut, California, and I can't remember the other state have uh, decided to drop the uh, mask mandate for schools. Um, mm -hmm. which I couldn't have imagined happening even a few weeks ago. So I hope we're going in the right direction. Yeah. Patrick. So there's your encouraging note, Kylie. See, <laughs> well, I, was just think, I was just picturing you at the IBS show. I've never seen anybody so <laughs> on fire. I mean, that is just, you are in your <laughs> element when you're at that show. It's contagious. If anybody winds up at IBS next year, find Patrick. You'll, you'll have a really good time. And the podcast from the show, which mm -hmm. Andrew are doing uh, this time, uh, That's right, are yeah. super fun. Emily I, I Matram is going to be on that one, too. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, a couple of live um, pro um, recordings of the BS and Beer show are happening there this week. Steve Basic and is it Alexis, his daughter? Uh, Steve Basic, Alexandra, yeah. Alexandra, sorry. And then um, also um, St um, Joe Stebrick and his daughter. It's kind of like the dad, the pop and daughter show. <laughs> That's kind of cool, I, you know. Mm -hmm. Boy, we need more building scientists. Uh, please, folks, do that. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Ian, Kylie, Jeff, and you for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building.